Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Fabiana Bacchini. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. And since the beginning of this pandemic, I've been hosting Facebook Live every Monday and Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, bringing specialists, uh, healthcare professionals, and parents to share the experiences, their latest research, and everything related to prematurity that is relevant for parents and other professionals watching us at this time. And today you're gonna to talk about a very important topic for NICU parents, which is peer support. And I have uh, Kate Robson here, who is a specialist in the topic. And she is, um, the Kate is a mother of two premature babies. One of her daughters was born uh, preterm with 500 grams, 25 weeks are born in 2005, and the other came at 32 weeks in 2007. Inspired by her own experiences, she came back to the NICU in 2010 to work with families as a neonatal intensive care unit family support specialist. Since then, she has developed programs for hospitalized families and trained peer counselors across Canada. She went back to school in 2008 to become a therapist and now has a private practice in Toronto where she offers support to NICU parents and clinicians. She also didn't mention that she was a head, the head of uh, the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation <laughs> for many years and she, she still sits on our board and does amazing volunteer work for uh, CPBF. Kate, welcome and thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here and to get a chance to talk with you. Thank you. Kate, your passion to support NICU families is absolutely inspiring to me and to many of us in this community. And you've been doing this for so many years in one of the biggest NICUs in Canada. And you've trained, as you mentioned in your bio, hundreds of former NICU parents to do the same work that you've been doing now. Uh, did you have this kind of support in your own NICU uh, experience that led you to do this work now? Not formally. I did have, I did make friendships that I still treasure today. There were people who were just ahead of me on the journey who were there in those really confusing, frightening moments. And I valued them so much. And then you know, we spent a lot of time at different hospitals too. We did a full tour of Toronto <laughs> hospitals. So at, at some places it was easier to make connections and to make friends. At other places you really didn't have the opportunity. And in those places it felt really lonely. And staff are wonderful. You can make great connections with staff, but there is something very special about connecting and talking with somebody who's been there, you know? So yes, so, so nothing formal, but really valuable all the same. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about peer support. How important it is peer support and how is this playing a big role in the family's journey that I see you? Oh, I think it's transformative. I think that it helps you realize that you know, when your baby comes early or your baby is sick and spends time in the NICU, you are now part of a community, right? And because when that happens to you, you lose so much. You lose the dream of the full-term pregnancy. You lose things like baby showers. Um, you lose celebratory moments. And we can get very focused on what we've lost. And that's very reasonable. But we also gain something. And the thing that we gain is this community. You know, people who have had similar experiences, who've been through tough times and who will understand us, right? It's hard, like if you're talking to somebody who's had a full-term baby and you're doing, you, you wanna talk about the grief that you feel about not having had a baby shower. Or I remember saying once to one of my friends who's lovely, you know, it's not her fault that she didn't understand, but I felt sad because I was just like, oh, it's kind of weird that I'm, you know, I had C-sections and I never had, I never went through labor pains. I'm kind of curious about what that's like. And she was just, oh, don't be an idiot. But it's sort of like, you know, it's okay. I get to feel, I get to have a feeling about that, you know? And I feel like NICU parents, we understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, and I think peer support too. Um, so there's the understanding, there's the community, and there's also the finding meaning in the experience. And I think that can be very protective and very healing once you find that meaning. And that, that community brings with it a sense of, yeah, maybe this is, this is something that I've learned, this is how I've grown, that that's something you get through connecting with other people. Absolutely. And I feel the peer support is not only for the time you are in the NICU or the first year at home, oh, yeah. because your baby is going to have challenges and sometimes not huge challenges, but a smaller challenge that 
no other parent can relate because it could be related to prematurity, but that experience can be shared with somebody from school who had not that experience, for instance. And I think the power of this community is so uh, strong and valuable to families in any age of their, their children. And we, I mean, and you and I know parents of uh, adults now, right? Who are Ooh. adults now who were born premature and we still have that connection. Absolutely. Because it helps, you know, again, sometimes when you talk to people who don't know much about prematurity and they kind of think, well, you know, so your kid is, your kids are 15 and 12, does it still matter? And it's like, well, it doesn't, and it doesn't, you know, it, you know, my children's prematurity helps me understand what they, what they need today. It helps me understand um, certain supports that they might need in a classroom that won't be immediately obvious based on, well, I'll say their lack of a formal diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's something that's been a real privilege and really interesting being part of our online peer support community. You know, is, CPPF has this beautiful online support group and like a couple thousand members now. And we have people from every stage of the journey, right? We have people who just had their babies yesterday to people, you know, like me, who have, you know, teen preemies. We also have um, people who were born premature themselves who can share from their own experience. So I think that's really valuable that it's... Um, and I don't see this as sort of like a dark or a sad thing that the journey continues, that the prematurity journey doesn't end in the NICU. I say it as a very hopeful thing that, you know, when your kid runs into certain, not even obstacles, but um, when they run into things, there is a community with which you can explore solutions and ways of dealing with it. Um, because otherwise you can be very alone and very in the dark. Absolutely. Yeah. Kate, now uh, we obviously, we've been, supporting uh, peer support groups in hospitals for so many years and mm -hmm. we saw this growing over the years and we're so proud to see how many uh, parent partners were in these hospitals doing their work for families and since yeah. the COVID started uh, in March unfortunately all the groups were suspended for obvious reasons and I feel that was a big loss for families yeah. but we also saw a bigger uh, audience in our online peer support groups. We are hosting a real-time peer support group and we saw the, the need of it. But yeah. we've also been moderating CPVF's online peer support group for many years, which we mm. do have a lot of uh, uh, people there, over 2,500 now. Uh, what have you learned over the years from doing this online group? Is this as valuable as it is the in-person? or What are the key differences and how can we actually fill that gap online? Yeah. So I, I do think there is something about an in-person experience that is very special. You know, at my hospital, we haven't been able to do the in-person groups. And I really, I'm so sad about that. And I'll be so excited when we can get it started safely again. Uh, that said, and, and I will say I came to the online, um, you know, we have these weekly online groups. And I was sort of a little bit anxious beforehand, like, will this be a valuable experience? Will this feel at all as useful as the in-person experience and I would say now we've been doing it for months and I love it and I hope we keep doing it but I think those two things ideally we do both you know so you have the in-person experience for when it's uh, accessible and useful for people but you also do the online because okay there's so many things to say here for one people with small babies they can't get to an in-person group right or it's RSV season um, or, you know, uh, hopefully not another global pandemic, but there's all kinds of reasons and barriers that prevent people from getting to someplace in person. And the other thing is that what I'm noticing is that people are bringing their real stuff. We're making real connections. Um, we've been doing it for months now. So we've been, you know, our members, um, their, their babies are going through stages of trying solids for the first time and we're able to share that together. Um, there's so many celebratory moments that we've been able to share together. So I think these things can can be part, I mean, my dream would be to have, you know, all this goes away, pandemic goes away, we start doing the in-person stuff as well, but then we keep going with the online support. And I think for people who live, you know, not in an urban center too, for people who live in the country, uh, it's really, there's nothing there for them. And so this can really, really fill a need. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree with you, because if you, for us who live in, in big cities, there is always a community group happening somewhere or other groups happening that we can easily access, but families in rural areas or in very remote areas of Canada, there is not an easy access sometimes, and especially if they live in the very north where there is almost 
no resource available. So I, I, I share that sentiment with you that we should continue offering that group. But also you talk about celebrating those milestones online, but there's also a lot of sharing of emotions and it's oh, yes. a place to validate your emotions. Let's talk a little bit about that too, because this is something that we don't find easily somewhere else. Absolutely. Well, and it kind of connects with what I said earlier about, um, you know, and this is something that, you know, in private practice, I hear this with when I meet parents in the NICU in my unit, I hear this and it's come up in our groups as well, that people feel both a lot of grief about uh, an experience that was stolen from them about something that they that they really miss. They, they feel the, the trauma, um, the burden of fear that they've lived with for so long while their babies were in the NICU. Then they also feel a guilt about even having those feelings. There's this awareness that, oh, some, every, the number of times people start off by saying, I know I shouldn't feel this way. I know I shouldn't feel um, sad that I didn't get a baby shower. I know I should, shouldn't be so worried about him because you know, he was born at 28 weeks and other babies come earlier. Um, but here's what I'm feeling. And there's this real burden of guilt the saying, there's this kind of idea that I'm not entitled to feel bad or to feel anything about this because I know that other people have bigger burdens, right? And so I think like on the one hand, I do think it's beautiful and important to acknowledge, um, you know, that other people are carrying very heavy burdens, you know, and that's important to stay open to that um, and to recognize our own privilege, to be grateful for what we do have. But at the same time, if we're feeling it, then it is there and it deserves to be named and acknowledged and you can give it space, you know, because those sadnesses, we can either talk about them and process them and try to think about how we can restore something to our lives that was taken from us, or we can try and push it away. Um, but that doesn't really work because it's just going to come back. It's going to come back as resentment. It's going to come back as loneliness. It's going to come back as anger. And that's not necessarily what we want, right? So I think that is something that has become such an important theme for me and that I've actually personally learned from, that it's okay to acknowledge your own pain. It doesn't erase somebody else's, right? It's not a competition. There's room, you know? And, it, and part of being able to be open and to help somebody else is to acknowledge your own pain and to be like, yes, I'm a human being. I feel these things. And that might give me space to be then able to turn to you and say, and how can I help you, right? Um, but there's, there's room for us all to acknowledge our feelings and talk about what's important to us. Yeah. Absolutely. Kate, and all, you also became a therapist recently. And uh, early in the pandemic, you really stepped up to create this new program that we are running, the COVID care program. So we are offering um, a free ch of charge for families in the NICU and post to start two sessions online with a therapist. Kate, I really want to talk about this because I think it's very important. This is something that you had in mind for many years to do. And the pandemic really pushes <laughs> fast, <laughs> very, to move very fast to implement this program. How are families are coping and parents or healthcare professionals watching us here today? How can they access this program, see if they, they fit to the criteria and how can they uh, benefit from it? Yeah, well, if you are in the NSC right now or if you're recently discharged, so under a year out, um, you can go to the CPBF website. And when we post this, we can post a link in the comments uh, and fill out a very simple application form. And we've really tried to make it um, very low barrier to participation. Uh, then you get two sessions um, with a counselor, uh, somebody trained in perinatal mental health. And sometimes in two sessions, like I wish we could do more because, and that's some of the feedback that people are like, I love it. I just want to keep seeing you. And it's like, yes, you know, I, I wish we could do more and hopefully someday we will. The benefit of two sessions is that it gives people a game plan, right? It gives them the chance to kind of assess where am I? What kind of help do I need? It gets the, the really important thing is it gives them the opportunity to tell their story because sometimes they've never had a chance to tell the whole story to somebody who can hold it and who can help them process it. Um, and, then it, and then it gives them a sense of like, and what do I do next? You know, do I need to connect with my family doctor? Um, is there some, you know, we can do a screening to sort of see, you know, the Edinburgh is a very good tool for that. And um, so I can kind of, I can take my own mental health temperature, right? And I can figure out what do I need? And then with the counselor, you can kind of work out and what are the next steps? So I think that's where it's been such a privilege. It's been really beautiful working with parents on this because parents are really wise about what they need. You know, they really know. 
and they know that they know when something's not right. Yeah. And that's something that I've learned a lot from that people know. And what we need to do as a society, as an organization is to empower people that if you know that something's not right, then please talk about it. Please feel there. Let's erase that stigma. Let's encourage people to connect with somebody who can help them because you can feel better. You know, you don't have to carry this burden of sadness. Um, you can talk to somebody and you can start working on it. So I think that's my question to you because sometimes, yeah, we do have the stigma. I think that's the one thing. The second thing is how do we identify what your feelings are okay to feel? Because I just had this traumatic experience. I went through the NICU or I lost a, a twin or my baby's not doing so well. And then of course you're going to feel sad. You're going to feel angry, perhaps have the grief. So when do you know those are things that kind of, um, okay to feel i'm not going to say normal to feel but okay mm -hmm. to feel and uh, or when is the time to seek help like a professional help yeah. there is this uh, in my mind somebody who had depression or somebody who could not leave the bed could not go shower so that's the image i had in my head for many years so mm -hmm. i never thought oh, i'm not depressed because i i do get up i do go shower and i do function but how do you identify when you actually need the help such a good question. So I think, I mean, there are screening tools like the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, and that's available online, and we can post it in the comments and people can look at that. Uh, but I think, I think what's a good approach is that um, we don't need to wait until we're really suffering before we talk to somebody. You know, if we just normalize talking to people early and often about how we're feeling, uh, I would love for people to feel comfortable doing that. I don't have to wait until I'm in crisis. Now, if I'm noticing that I can't sleep, if I'm noticing that I go to bed and have the opportunity to sleep and yet my brain won't calm down, um, it's racing, it won't, it won't you know, let me relax into slumber, that would be, that's a really important sign that it, it would be great to talk to somebody. Um, if you're noticing in terms of your mood, are you noticing that, that you know, quick to anger in ways that feel unfamiliar to you? If you're noticing that things that usually bring you joy and pleasure, um, it's not just sort of one day of feeling low, but if you're noticing that on repeated days that, oh, you know, this, I'm not, the, the flowers that I usually love, I'm not even seeing. Um, my baby is so sweet and I'm kind of like, oh yeah, I love you, but I'm not feeling that joy. Then talk to somebody, absolutely. Um, I kind of wish if I can share from my own experience, um, when I came home with my first, um, I, I mean, I didn't think I was in trouble. I thought that I'd got through and that I was fine. And for the first couple of years, um, I lived with a very heavy burden of fear, a real capital F fear, fear of all kinds of things. Looking back, I realize now, oh, that I should have talked to somebody, you know? That fear, I mean, I did have fun with my baby. She was a very cute baby, still is a very nice person. Um, but that fear robbed me of a lot of joy that I could have had. And and that's why I'm so, I hope not to be pushy. I hope that it's more invitational, but I'm really trying to encourage people talk early and often about your feelings. Don't be shy about bringing it up with your doctor. Um, it can feel really hard to, to, to go there, but they can be a great resource for you. Public health nurses can be wonderful. Also our peer support community, you know, talk about it there. And people who live in your community can tell you about groups, about numbers to call, about great counselors. Um, but the more we talk about it, the more normal it becomes and the safer everybody feels in sharing how they're doing and what they need. And also hospitals do provide uh, social workers uh, for families who need. And so there, there are yeah. resources available. You can Absolutely. just ask people for it. Absolutely. And social workers, our social workers in our hospital are so wonderful. And they, you know, because they can help you with all you know, there's this whole stream of like paperwork and accessing benefits and they can help with that. But then they, they're gifted listeners and counselors mm -hmm. and they can just make space for your feelings and help you start processing while you're in the NICU. So they are a fantastic resource. And so, and people can be very like, oh, I don't want to talk to social work, but they, they can be fantastic resources for families. So I would really encourage parents in the NICU to make friends with your social worker if you can. Yeah, Absolutely. And I, I never forget my social worker who came to me every time and a she kind of knew the day that I was so down in the ICU that she just showed up and it was incredible. And I'm so grateful that I had the help when I needed, uh, especially with the loss of my twin. It was so important to have somebody to talk to in the ICU. 
So Katie, but you also have some very practical techniques for families to use to help them to stay connected and grounded. Can you share some of them with us? Well, and I should say that a lot of these I've learned from families, right? So this is what's so great about doing this work is that you learn something new from, uh, from every family you talk with, right? So in fact, earlier we were running a support group and, and um, this story came to mind. It was a mom I met many years ago in, the, in our unit. Um, another mother was just having a very heavy day and really consumed with guilt about, I didn't get my baby to term, my body failed, I'm a failure. And this other mother was just like, you know, hey, imagine you're a captain of a ship and a captain of a ship who gets her ship close enough to shore so that everybody gets off alive. We call that captain a hero. That captain is a hero. And she, and so she, and she was really intense. She was so beautiful, this, this mom. And you could just see the other mother. You could just see the change. It was a metaphor that helped her take a different view on her experience. And it didn't erase the pain. It's not meant to reframe the pain away. It's just meant to give you another option for being like, oh, maybe this is something, maybe this is a meaning, a layer of meaning that I can add to this experience. So that is something which is just like, can you work with a met metaphor? Can you find a way of telling the story that, f that is a bit more empowering? That can be really, really powerful. I do think, and this is sounds so boring and I wish it weren't true, <laughs> but something that I've been benefiting from during this whole pandemic is structure and thinking about those four pillars of well-being. You think about movement, daily movement, but we can call it exercise. It doesn't even have to be exercise, but moving your body every day, social connection every day, decent nutrition and decent sleep, right? So if you can put, if you can take a reasonable swack at each of those every day, you're going to keep yourself within your zone of functionality. It doesn't mean that every day is going to be the best day ever. It means you're going to be able to keep moving forward. And I think that is really powerful because right now it's hard to move forward. Some days I feel like I'm crawling, you know, but I feel as long as I'm doing something that moves me forward, even like that much, that's enough. Um, so I think that can be very powerful. Just reminding yourself of my four pillars. Have I ticked them off today? Great. And good enough. Good enough. Very, very powerful, mm -hmm. important words. My favorite words <laughs> in the world, I think. Um, and I think the other thing is, is figuring out, it's sort of like developing your own let's say regulation or regulatory toolbox, right? What are the things when I'm feeling unmoored, when I'm feeling panicked, when I'm feeling super, super upset, when I'm feeling like this is never gonna end and, and that kind of always everything language starts growing and getting bigger. What are the things available to me that work for me? May not work for you, but they work for me to help me just kind of ground and come back down, right? So mindfulness can show up here. Um, there can be grounding exercises where you, you know, you do a bit of a sensory exploration of the room. You, you know, you listen for the closest sound. You try and find things of different colors. You do something that brings you into the present moment and into your body. That can be really helpful. Um, you might smell a beautiful smell, right? That might be something that just helps you create a little bit of space, a little bit of room, and you can just, and just, you, you can't make all the bad feelings go away. I wish we could. It doesn't work like that. But sometimes we can give ourselves a little bit of space from them so that we can make choices about how we're going to deal with them. So, and all of these things pretty much are things that I've learned from um, NIC families. You know, just these ways of how can I be in the moment and remind myself of who I am, you know, because this is a thing that parents do too, that we are so focused on other people's needs. We're so focused on making sure that our kids are okay, that our partner's okay, that everybody's getting their fruits and vegetables. Are we eating the fruits and vegetables? Are we taking a moment, you know, to remind ourselves that, you know, we don't always have to be, you know, at the top of the list. I get that, you know, we're parents, we're going to be worried about other people. We need to be on the list somewhere, right? We need to be on the page. So I think anything that helps you just come back into your own page and just take a moment, doesn't have to be a visit to the spa, doesn't have to be anything, you know, it just has to be little, but just something that reminds you that you matter deeply, deeply important. Wow, I love that. I absolutely love at least being on the list. That's no, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we, we, we don't forget about that. Uh, also, a lot of families usually share with us, like journal is very uh, a therapeutic format of expression of the emotions. And it works for a lot of people. It, it did work for me when I was in the NICU and I found it very 
Actually, and it's nice now to actually go back and read the journal to say, oh my God, I did go through all this. I don't, some things I didn't remember. Yeah. And acknowledge that I had all those feelings in me, which is, yeah. wow. It is yeah. overwhelming even sometimes when you read it. Yeah. And it's such a reminder. When you said that, I got a bit of a chill um, because what a reminder that you can do hard things, you know, and that's a reminder that probably can show up at different points and really help you, you know, during hard times. It's like, okay, this is tough, but I can do hard things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think that's how we also build resilience, right? In our, in our lives. And I want to talk, I'll ask you, talk about what is what, things that we learn in the NICU, right? Because I think there's a lot of lessons in an ICU. And even like when looking back into what I, the hardships I went through, those lessons that you learn, how can we use them to help our families now and help ourselves? Because yes, we do forget how hard it was, you know, three, four years from now, you have, you know, the trauma is still there, but you don't have that solid and clear um, image anymore sometimes. And, but there's so many life lessons there. Absolutely. Well, I will say that something that's come up a lot, both in our online group and with the parents I meet in the unit, but that NICU parents uh, are really well prepped to thrive in a pandemic because we're great at cleaning our hands and we're good at staying home. <laughs> you know, we're very resourceful in that way. <laughs> we were wired for that years ago and we didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So, so in some ways, a lot of NICU parents, I can't tell you the number of people who have said to me, it's just like, this feels like like, I know how to do this. And it's like, yeah, you know, it was hard won knowledge, but yeah, we know it. We do know it. I think there's something about, um, there's so many things that we learn in the NICU, you know, um, that there's the value of your village about finding those people who you trust, uh, who you can talk to, finding the experts. Like we talk about this in our unit, evidence-based living. You know, so taking some of the principles of evidence-based medicine and applying them to how am I going to live, right? So I find the resources I trust, I listen to them, I kind of filter out the noise, you know, the stuff that the, you know, my great aunt who has very strong opinions about how I should put my baby to sleep, don't need to listen to her, you know? Um, and I think those types of skills can really serve us well at a time like this when we're getting so much conflicting information. We just kind of think, you know, what's my risk tolerance? Who are the people I trust? Who am I going to listen to? make a plan that serves me and my family and move forward with that. And that's something I think a lot of us did learn in the NICU. I think we learned about the value of paying very close attention to our children and um, letting them tell us what they need. I think that's something that you learn in the NICU. And I think about valuing those small moments, like the first time you hold your baby, um, you know, valuing, celebrating milestones, celebrating whenever you can, you know, those are things that NICU parents are really good at and that are serving them really well right now. And I think the other thing that, um, like NICU parents are brilliant. There's this awesome mom who's um, part of our online group who threw her three-year-old a really beautiful uh, distance birthday party, you know, because we're not gonna let a little thing like the pandemic get in the way of celebrating um, our important days for our kids, right? So I think that, like that ability to name what has been lost, but then work to restore it, you know, to bring it back. Um, that is definitely something that NIC parents are great at. Yeah. Absolutely. Kate, one last message for the healthcare professionals watching us and the families watching us. Oh, for healthcare professionals, I, my goodness, I just, um, cause I still work in the NICU. I go in, you know, a day a week. And I remember the first time after the pandemic hit that I went in, I was so full of anxiety. I was really afraid. And I was thinking, what am I, uh, what am I getting myself into? Am I putting my own family at risk by going in here? Cause there's so much that was not known and is still not known about this virus. And so I just think about all those people working in NICUs who are going in every day and they're keeping themselves safe. They're working really hard, but they're also carrying this extra burden of anxiety and fear. And I'm so grateful to them because it is not easy. Um, and you know, I know that a lot of policies these days in the NICU, they don't, their NICUs aren't as open as they historically, as they usually are. And I, I know that's really hard for families. I know it's hard for staff. I do have faith that we will get through it and that we will be able to open up again and honor that connection, that really important connection between babies and parents. Um, but I just, my goodness, I'm so, so grateful to the health professionals who keep showing up because it is not easy. And I'm, 
I mean, and we couldn't do it without them, right? We absolutely need them and their passion and their knowledge and their skill. And then I think about the NICU parents. I think, you know, on the one hand, if this is your first NICU baby, you don't necessarily know about how things used to be. And I'm so endlessly amazed and inspired by how adaptable people are and that they'll just rise to every occasion. You may, you, I have to get a test before I come in? Cool, stick that thing up my nose. Like they're, they'll do whatever so that they can be with their babies. I do, it does break my heart because I think about, um, you know, if you have to be alone in the NICU and maybe you get some tough news or maybe your baby's not having a good day and the nurses are there, absolutely. And the doctors are there and they're helping you, but your partner's not there. You know, the person with whom like you do everything, they're not there. They're not going to be part of it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the hospitals that are now inviting both parents back in. I think that's really important. I hope more can follow suit and find safe ways of doing that. I think it's, that's really, really important. But mostly I think to the parents who are there right now, I just want them to know um, we see you, we're listening, we're here, we wanna support you. Uh, this is temporary, it's not gonna be forever. And on the other side of it, there's this beautiful community waiting for you. Um, and yeah, we just, we would, like to do just literally anything we can to make it easier. We know that it's tough. We know that it's tough. Um, I do think it's a powerful thing to remember that it's, that it's not forever though, that you will someday, hopefully soon, be at home with your baby. Um, and this will be in, this will be, I guess, your rear view mirror, does that make sense? You know what I mean? <laughs> it won't be, it, you, won't have to, you won't have to fight this fight every day. Um, so I just hope that in the, in those really hard moments, you can just remember that I think uh, no feeling is final. That's a really important thing to remember. Absolutely. Kate, thank you so much for joining us here today to, for sharing your, uh, your own story, but also your experience and all your knowledge that you gained all these years working in the ICU. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you everyone for watching us here today. So just a, a, a reminder that Kate Robson's group run every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And to access her group, you can join the Canadian Premium Parent Support Network, which is our private Facebook group. And every Monday and Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, I'm hosting Facebook Live with different experts, healthcare professionals, researchers, and parents from all over Canada to share their uh, experiences and their knowledge with us. All past uh, sessions are recorded and available on our website, and you can watch them on the CanadianPremies.org. Thank you, everyone, and I see you next time.